This conference will now be recorded. So okay. We're, we're now starting session three, and we will just cover a little bit of material from last time before jumping into the new session lecture. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning slash afternoon. So like Ema said, uh, we're just going to finish the end of the lecture two slides before proceeding on to lecture three. So at the end of lecture two, um, for those of you who don't recall, we were looking at different ways of evaluating a model. So we looked at some different graphics. We started off with rock curves, and then we looked at performance diagrams, and then we finished off by looking at reliability curves. And I was hoping to have time to get to attributes diagrams, which are basically fancy reliability curves. And we didn't quite have a chance to get to that at the end of the lecture. So that's what we're going to do today before jumping into the lecture three material, which will be on decision trees. So um, we finished off with this slide where we have a, uh, the, for a reliability curve, the forecast is always on the x-axis and then the conditional mean observation is on the y-axis. So what this curve, for example, is telling you is that when you, uh, it's telling you when you forecast a given temperature what the expected actual temperature is. So this point at the left-hand side of the curve is telling you when you forecast minus 65, the mean actual temperature is minus 58. And then on the right-hand side of the curve, this rightmost point is telling you that when you forecast 25 Fahrenheit, the mean actual temperature is about 18 Fahrenheit. So at the right end of the curve, you're over-forecasting or overconfident, And at the left end of the curve, you're under-forecasting or underconfident. So you can do something fancy with reliability curves and turn them into attributes diagrams by adding some reference lines and some shading in the background. Um, and you can read more about the attributes diagram in this paper by Shu and Murphy from 1986, which is actually a really nice um, academic but also didactic paper, and it really teaches you what the attributes diagram is. So you still, uh, as in the original reliability curve, you have this reference line, which is just the one-to-one -one line. That's where you want your reliability curve to be. So that reference line is still in the attributes diagram, that diagonal gray line. So that's where you you want the reliability curve to be as close as that to that one-to-one -one line as possible. Then you have a gray vertical line, which shows you the climatology. That's the average over the training data. So if you have a binary classification problem, like I'm showing here where you have forecast probability on the x-axis and then conditional event frequency on the y-axis, this vertical line is showing you the climatology over the training data. So this is telling you the event, um, which in this case is strongly rotating storms, occurs about 10% of the time or 0.1 out of one times in the training data. And the gray horizontal line is the no resolution line. The, um, the value of this gray horizontal line it, on the y-axis is the same as the value of the um, the vertical line on the x-axis. So this um, this is also the, the climatological frequency in the training data. And if your reliability curve follows this horizontal gray line, it's called the no resolution line. So if the reliability curve follows that line, that means your model has absolutely no resolution. It means that for any probability your model forecasts, the conditional event frequency is always the same. So that means your model is providing no information whatsoever. If the conditional event frequency is always 10%, whether you forecast 20 or 40 or 60 or 80 or 100%, then your model's not useful. And then the last reference line in the attributes diagram is this blue shaded area, which is the positive skill area. This tells you where the Breyer skill score is greater than zero or the Breyer score is better than climatology. And the Breyer score is just the mean squared error between your um, your forecasts and your observations. So in this case, um, for, for classification, and that's what I show on the next slide here, um, for classification, this is the equation for the Breyer score, this top one out of the two equations. So it's the mean squared error between the forecast probabilities and the true labels. So P sub I is the forecast event probability for the ith example, and then Y sub I is the label for the ith example, where it's one if the event actually occurs and zero if the event doesn't actually occur. And then to convert Breyer score into Breyer skill score, you take this second equation here where BS subscript climo is the Breyer score that you would get by always, um, always forecasting the climatological mean or the mean in the training data. So if your event occurs 10% of the time, for example, if you're forecasting um, tornadoes or mesocyclones, and you find that your uh, you find that tornadoes occur in 10% of the training data. Um, BS Climo is the Breyer score that you would achieve by always forecasting a probability of 10% and using no other information. Just saying 
the event occurs 10% of the time in the training data, so I'm always going to forecast a probability of 10%. Um, so the Briar skill score varies from minus infinity to plus one, as does any true skill score. Um, so for anything that's a true skill score, the range of possible values is the same, and then the interpretation is the same. Higher is better, and a value greater than zero means that your um, your model is better than the reference model, which in this case is climatology. So a uh, Briar skill score, a, a positive Briar skill score is good, and the best possible Briar skill score you can have is one. Um, so as long as your reliability curve falls in this blue shaded area, this tells you all the points along the x-axis where your model is better than climatology. So your model is providing information over just the, the baseline. Um, and here, this is the, uh, the last slide from lecture two before we go on to lecture three. Uh, so this is, this is an attributes diagram for regression instead of classification. So in the attributes diagram I showed you for classification, there was also this histogram uh, sort of inset inside the plot that I glossed over. So this histogram shows you the um, the, the frequency of, of each forecast probability. So it tells you that um, <clears throat> this, this bar here corresponds to forecast probabilities around 0.016 or 1.6%. And then the next one is 12%, 22%, 32%, etc. And you can see that this is a highly skewed distribution. So lower forecast probabilities occur much more often than higher forecast probabilities. For a regression problem, you can plot two histograms in the um, in the background of your attributes diagram. So this, uh, in this case, we're predicting the maximum future vorticity for a given storm. So both the forecast value and the observed value are in units of inverse seconds or seconds to the minus one. So this histogram here is showing you the um, how often each predicted value occurs, and this histogram here is showing you how often each observed value occurs. And ideally, you'd like to see some correspondence between these two histograms. You want to um, you want to reproduce the the distribution of the observations as well as you possibly can with your forecasts. Um, and all the text on this slide is the same as the text from two slides ago. I just replaced the figure with a regression problem instead of a binary classification problem. Um, so that's all I wanted to talk about for model evaluation. Any reference that was, uh, or any any citation that was used uh, in the slides, the references are all at the end here, and you can just click on the URLs to find the papers. So I tried to make that as easy as possible. Um, so now I have to get out of full screen mode. There we go. <clears throat> and we'll start with lecture three. And this is always, okay. <clears throat> Is everyone seeing my slides? I'll, I'll assume they are. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Excuse me. So lecture three is gonna cover decision trees and then forests, which are ensembles of decision trees and then clustering. So I'll start with the overview for this lecture. The link to the CoLab notebook I just sent out to the class mailing list about 15 minutes ago. So everyone should have that link so you're not gonna have to copy uh, every single weird character off the link here, so don't worry about that. Um, so this session is gonna cover decision trees and then random forests, which is one way to ensemble decision trees, gradient boosted forests, which is a different way to ensemble decision trees, k-means clustering, a glum word of hierarchical clustering, and then we'll cover db scan, which is another clustering method in just a couple slides at the very end. So section two is gonna be decision trees in theory, and then I'll show you some examples of decision trees in practice. And when we get to the CoLab notebook, which we're gonna spend a full 30 minutes on today, so I'm gonna stop talking at, uh, at two o'clock mountain time, and then we're gonna go to the CoLab notebook and you'll see more examples of decision trees in practice, and I'll show you um, some of the guts of the code and a little more nitty gritty stuff on how to apply them. Um, so a decision tree is just a flow chart with branch nodes, which are the ellipses in this figure, and then leaf nodes, which are the rectangles in this figure. So this is a toy example. Before you start um, thinking that this was a decision tree, I actually trained, this is just a dummy example that I made up. Um, and in this example, we're trying to forecast the probability of severe hail. So again, this is a classification problem instead of a regression problem. It doesn't matter what the threshold for severe hail is because I completely made this up. So whatever you call severe, one inch, two inches. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, it's a really shallow decision tree. It doesn't have too many levels. 
the first question is asking about the CAPE or the convective available potential energy in the storm. Is it at least 1,500 joules per kilogram? If the answer is yes, you always go down the right arrow or the green arrow. And if the answer is no, you go down the red arrow. So for each storm, you just send it in the top of this decision tree. And then according to the answer to each question, you send it down the the right arrow or the left arrow until you reach a, uh, a leaf node or a terminal node. And this gives you the forecast probability of severe hail. So if a storm ends up in this leaf node at the left, the forecast probability of severe hail is 5%. And if a storm ends up in the leaf node at the right, the forecast probability is 60%. Um, so you'll notice that the branch nodes, sometimes people call these split nodes as well, they're bifurcating. So there's only two arrows coming out of each branch node. Sometimes, not very often, but sometimes people get fancy and will train a decision tree with branch nodes that aren't bifurcating. So they have three-way splits or four-way splits or 10-way splits, but we're not going to cover that. Um, I almost never see that done in practice. And then the leaf nodes are terminal. So once you've gotten to a leaf node, you can't keep going through the decision tree. Um, so each branch node has two children, and then each leaf node has no children at all because you're at the end. Um, so the questions which are asked at the branch nodes, they're based on predictor variables, and then uh, the leaf nodes give you your, your prediction. Um, and since the branch nodes are bifurcating, the questions have to be yes or no. So there's always, um, there's always a predictor variable at the beginning and then a threshold at the end, and you're asking, is the predictor variable greater than or equal to that threshold? So CAPE and 1,500 joules per kilogram, or max reflectivity and 65 dBZ, or downdraft CAPE and 1,000 joules per kilogram, et cetera. There's always a variable, and then there's a threshold on that variable. Um, so decision trees have a pretty long history in atmospheric science. They've actually been used since the 1960s. The first reference I could find was this Chisholm 1968 reference. Uh, early decision trees, though, were created subjectively by human experts. There was no machine learning involved. They weren't trained by computers, by learning from data. It was uh, a human expert who created a decision tree based on what they knew about the weather phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> and I found, uh, when I worked at Environment Canada, I found a whole bunch of old internal literature there with decision trees that they used to forecast fog. They really loved using decision trees for fog. And then um, Quinlan, back in 1986, finally created an objective algorithm to train decision trees. So that's when decision trees went from being expert systems to being machine learning. Um, and the process of training a decision tree means that you find the best question at each one of these branch nodes. So you have to find the best combination of predictor variable and threshold on the predictor variable. So these are the, um, the values or the parameters inside a decision tree that are tweaked during training. Um, and then the prediction made at each leaf node L is just the average overall training examples that reach leaf node L. So when you, when you have a trained decision tree and you've, you've frozen it, so the, the, the decision tree has already been created and you go to apply it to new data, this is the way you apply it to new data. So for example, if your new storm ends up falling in this leaf node at the left-hand side, and then you look through the training examples that reach this leaf node, and you see, oh, we had 100 training storms reach this leaf node, and five of them had severe hail, so the forecast probability is going to be 5 over 100, or 5%, or 0 0.05, if you will. Um, for So that's for a classification problem. For a regression problem, you do the same thing. You just take the average overall training examples that reach this leaf node, except for regression, this forecast will be a real value instead of a probability of some event. So if you're predicting the actual hail size instead of just probability of severe hail, you would look at, uh, again, let's say 100 storms in the training set reach this leaf node, and say their average, uh, the average hail size in those storms is 0 0.75 inches. That'll be your predicted hail size for the new storm. So that's how you do regression instead of classification here. So during the training procedure for a decision tree, the best question at a given branch node, the way, the way you determine what's the best question to ask is you find the question that, that maximizes information gain. So the training algorithm will loop, for example, if you have 41 predictor variables, which is what we have in the CoLab notebooks in the examples that we're going to be doing later today, you have 41 predictor variables. And I think by default, the training algorithm will try 100 thresholds on each predictor variable or something like that. So it'll loop over all 41 predictor variables and then loop over 100 thresholds on each predictor variable. So it'll try 4,100 different combinations of predictor variable and threshold. And then it'll find the one combination that maximizes your information gain. 
and I'll tell you what that means uh, further down the slide. So for a regression problem, when you're predicting a real value, information gain is maximized by minimizing mean squared error. So the mean squared error between predicted and actual hail sizes, for example, sticking with that hail analogy. Um, for classification, instead of regression, information gain is maximized by minimizing the Gini impurity at the child nodes. And the Gini impurity is just defined by this equation here. So it's 2F times 1 minus F, where, um, oh, there's no N in this equation. You can ignore that line. I should take that out. Um, so the, the only variable on the right-hand side of the equation is, um, is just F. And F is the event frequency. So it's the fraction of storms with severe hail in the, the examples that reach each, each one of the child nodes. So ideally what you want, um, the, the perfect question would be one that splits the data into pure child nodes. So for example, if the problem were really, really easy, let's say that every storm with more than 1500 joules of Cape produces severe hail and every storm with less than 1500 joules of Cape doesn't produce severe hail, you could create pure child nodes by just asking this one question at the top. So say you have a thousand storms and a hundred gave you severe hail and 900 gave you non-severe hail. Um, if if the data set followed this perfect CAPE relationship, you'd end up with one child node that has 100 storms that all produce severe hail, and another child node that has 900 storms that all don't produce severe hail. And in that case, um, for the, the child node that contains only non-severe storms, F would be zero, so this whole thing would be zero. And for the child node that only contains severe storms, F would be one, so one minus F would be zero, so this whole thing would be zero. So the impurity at both of the child nodes would be zero because you've created a perfect split. You've got one child node with only severe hail storms and one with only non-severe hail storms. Um, so the last few slides have talked about the training procedure for a decision tree for determining the question at each branch node. Um, but one thing you might have noticed is that you can, um, you can grow a decision tree to an arbitrary depth. So there's the question of when do you stop adding branch nodes? Do you create a decision tree that's five levels deep, 10 levels deep, 20 levels deep. <clears throat> so you um, to determine when you stop creating new branch nodes, there's, uh, there's stopping criteria in the training procedure for a decision tree. Uh, so, so some common examples of stopping criteria, which you'll see today in the CoLab notebook, are minimum sample size. When I say sample size, I mean number of training examples. So the minimum sample size at, uh, at each branch node, the minimum sample size at each leaf node, so you can say, for example, um, once a leaf node has less than 50 examples, I, I stop training. So um, so you you create a decision. You, you don't keep going until each leaf node has one example in it. Um, so once the leaf nodes are down to 50 examples or less, you just stop training. That's an example of a stopping criterion. Another stopping criterion is just maximum depth. So you can govern the number of levels in the tree. So you can say, okay, once there's five levels in this decision tree, it's deep enough. And if I go deeper, I'm probably going to overfit the training data. So I'm going to stop. Um, so these stopping criteria are all hyperparameters, which means they have to be decided by the user a priori before you start training, because these, um, these stopping criteria can't be chosen during training. So there's something that you choose beforehand, and then you're stuck with that value you chose. So that's a hyperparameter. Um, and you can use several of these stopping criteria in tandem. So you can limit the maximum depth and the minimum sample size at the leaf nodes and the minimum sample size at the branch nodes if you want. Um, in general, if a decision tree is too shallow, it'll underfit. And if it's too deep, it'll overfit. So you can imagine a decision tree that only has this uh, this root node that only asks you one question about the data and then immediately goes to leaf nodes. Um, and in general, that type of, of decision tree is going to underfit. Uh, if you imagine the, the severe hail problem, that problem is definitely not simple enough that we can just say, oh, if CAPE is greater than 1,500 joules per kilogram, it's going to be a severe hail storm. So that decision tree is definitely going to underfit. And actually, a decision tree with, um, with only one question and then two leaf nodes is called a decision stump. So you may see that terminology around. Um, so there's there's two reductio ad absurdum. So I just went over one. Uh, a decision tree that only has one branch node is probably going to underfit. And if you keep growing the decision tree deep enough that you end up with only one example at each leaf node, that means all the predictions you make for future data are going to be based on one training example. And that's a bad thing because that's a really small sample size. So you're probably going to overfit your training data really badly. So you need to find a balance between the underfitting extreme and the overfitting extreme. 
and that's where hyperparameter tuning comes in. Um, so this next section is going to show you the results for a default decision tree. Um, when I say default, I just mean with the default hyperparameters, and then section four will show you the results for a fancier decision tree before we get into random forests. Um, this is stuff you'll see in the CoLab notebook a little later on as well. So for the default decision tree, I use these hyperparameters listed here. So a minimum of 30 examples at each branch node, a minimum of 30 examples at each leaf node, and then no limit on the depth of the tree. So these were um, the two stopping criteria that made sure the tree didn't, didn't get super deep. Um, each example or each data point is one storm object, so it's one storm at one time step. And then the prediction task is uh, we're trying to predict if a storm will develop strong rotation at any point in the future. Um, I apologize, I'm missing a couple uh, zeros after the decimal point. So the way, I, uh, the way I determine strong rotation is I just found the 90th percentile in the training data and said anything, um, anything greater than the 90th percentile of uh, vorticity is strong rotation. So this is actually 0 0.00385, so about 0 0.004 inverse seconds. Um, so this is a classification problem instead of a regression problem. So shown below for the default decision tree are the results on the training data. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing the rock curve. In the middle, I'm showing the performance diagram. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing the attributes diagram. I don't want to go into every nitty-gritty component of these figures. That's not the, um, the purpose of showing you these. Um, so I'm just going to look at a couple numbers here. So I'm going to look at the area under the rock curve. So as we went over in the lecture last week, this is a common way to evaluate how good a rock curve is. You just look at the area underneath it. The maximum possible area is 1. And if the area under the curve is greater than 0 0.9, your model is generally considered excellent. You say, OK, that's really good. So in this case, we have a rock curve with an AUC of 0.955. That's well over 0 0.9. So this would be considered an excellent rock curve. And then if you look at the attributes diagram, the, um, the reliability curve, which is this, this red line here, perfectly follows the one-to-one -one lines. That means this model has perfect reliability. When the forecast probability is 40%, the conditional event frequency is 40%, 60%. Um, the event frequency is 60%, 80%. The event frequency is 80%, et cetera, et cetera. So that means your forecasts are, um, are perfectly calibrated. So this default decision tree does really, really well on the training data. But then when you look at results on the validation data, which is this slide, there's, um, I mean, things don't get horrible, but things get markedly worse. So if you look at the rock curve, the AUC has dropped by about 0 0.1 or 10% 10, 10 of the, the maximum possible AUC. Um, and AUC is now less than 0 0.9. So this would no longer, on, on the validation data, this decision tree would no longer be considered an excellent predictor. And if you look at the performance diagram, it moved down towards the bottom left. So it definitely got worse. And if you look at the attributes diagram, the reliability on the validation data is not perfect like it was for the training data. Actually, this model has a um, has an an over prediction problem in general because this uh, this reliability curve is almost always below the one to one line. So, for example, when the forecast probability is sixty percent, the conditional event frequency is only forty five percent. So, when you forecast sixty percent, strong rotation only occurs about forty five percent of the time. When you forecast ninety percent, strong rotation only occurs sixty five or seventy percent of the time. So, there's a lot of over prediction happening here. Um, so basically, the fact that the results on the training data are so good and the results on the validation data are markedly worse means that this default decision tree has overfit. And that's a um, an endemic problem with decision trees. When you train just a single decision tree, um, they have a tendency to really horribly overfit. And the reason is that decision trees are really sensitive to these thresholds. So for example, uh, you can imagine a case where you take two completely identical storms but just tweak the cape value so one storm has a cape of 1499 joules per kilogram and the other storm has a cape of 1501 joules per kilogram um, and if you send those two storms down this decision tree one could end up with a forecast probability of five percent and one could end up with a forecast probability of 60 percent so because these exact thresholds are incorporated into decision trees that makes them really vulnerable to overfitting or really unstable um, this hyperparameter experiment, which is section four, I'm actually just going to show in the CoLab notebook at the end. I think that's a better um, a better way to show you that hyperparameter experiment. Um, but basically, what I do in this hyperparameter experiment is I play with 
<laughs> the values for two stopping criteria. So the minimum sample size per branch node and the minimum sample size per leaf node in the decision tree. And um, I find values that lead to almost no overfitting for the decision tree. So basically when you, um, when you make the values of these stopping criteria higher, you mitigate overfitting. So the next section is on random forest. Uh, random um, forest. Yes. May I ask a question, please? Yes. Yeah, this is um, probably a good time to stop for questions, actually. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my question is based on the example you've given. Wouldn't this be a case? You said that most of the decision trees that are trained and worked with are these binary decision trees. Is this the kind of problem that would be more amenable, though, to um, windows of values in order, you know, greater than um, a certain number but less than this, and then greater than or equal to or less than this. You know, instead of bifurcating between on a single value, um, having two values which are being assessed, and then it's three different decisions coming down. I'm just trying to get a feel for if it's random for, or I'm sorry, if uh, uh, decision trees are subject to overfitting is one way to get past the overfitting to move beyond a simple binary decision and make it a, a, a window of decisions. Um, that actually does happen in decision trees, but you can do that with branch nodes that only bifurcate. So for example, if you had a problem where, um, let's say again in a, in a weird ideal atmosphere, that storms with somewhere between 1500 and 2000 joules of cape always give you severe hail, um, whereas storms with less than 1500 and storms with greater than 2000 don't give you severe hail. You could still um, have a decision tree perfectly represent that relationship by having this root node at the top. So this root node at the top could ask if, if your cape is greater than or equal to 1500 joules. And then you could have another node below that that asks if your cape is greater than or equal to 2000 joules. Uh, so you yeah, could yeah, you could represent I, that relationship by having um, by having two branch nodes that both ask a binary question. You could represent that sort of window relationship that you were talking about. I got you. Thank you. Yeah, and that actually happens a lot in decision trees in practice. Yeah, thanks for the question. Are there any more questions before I go on to the next section? I just wanted to add, yeah, it's not always obvious, but you can use the same predictor variable several times. It doesn't have to just be used once. And so the example that Ryan was just given could do that. So like I just said in my example, where you have one storm with 1,499 joules of cape and another storm with 1,501 joules, this, um, the fact that you have these precise thresholds in a decision tree makes them unstable and prone to overfitting. So one way to, to mitigate that problem is take a bunch of decision trees that are all a little bit different and then ensemble them together. And that's, uh, this doesn't only happen with decision trees and machine learning. Uh, people often ensemble really simple models where the really simple models on their own, people will call them weak learners. So there's this whole theory on ensembles of weak learners where you can take a bunch of weak learners that don't make great predictions on their own, but if they overfit in different ways and have offsetting biases, you can ensemble them together to, to make a final model that, um, that has very low bias and makes good predictions. So this is what's done in random forests. You, to make each tree in the forest different, uh, each tree is trained with a different part of the data set. Um, so the individual trees will still overfit, but if they're diverse enough, you hope that they overfit in different ways, and when you ensemble them together, you get, uh, you get a good model. So random forests maintain that diversity or make the trees different from each other in two different ways. So one of those ways is called example bagging, or sometimes you'll see that called bootstrapping. And another way of making the trees different is called predictor bagging, or sometimes you'll see that called feature bagging, or sometimes it's called feature subsetting. Um, there's lots of different sets of jargon in the literature. <clears throat> so this uh, this figure on the right hand side is showing you um, the the example bagging part of random forest instead of the predictor bagging part. So what you do is you uh, you have your original data set. And then you take for to train each decision tree in the forest, you take a bootstrap replicate of this training set. 
So you bootstrap uh, all the examples in the training set and bootstrap sample one goes to decision tree one, bootstrap sample two goes to decision tree two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I talk more about that on this slide here. So bootstrapping, remember that bootstrapping is resampling with replacement. So if you uh, if your training set contains a thousand examples, when you bootstrap the training set, you randomly pick a thousand examples out of the training set. But every time you take one example out of the training set, you you leave it there. So you could pick the same example twice or three times or four times or five times. Um, so if the, the training set has n examples, each bootstrap replica, replicate will have n examples, so it'll be just as big as the training set. But on average, only 63.2% of those examples will be unique. And there's a, there's a mathematical law um, in the original paper on bootstrapping. I believe the author is Efron. Um, sorry, I didn't put the reference here. Um, but that 63.2% comes from 1 minus 1 over E, where E is Euler's number, so E is 2.72 or something like that. Um, so if you look at each one of these bootstrap replicates, bootstrap sample one and sample two and sample three, um, they each contain as many examples as the original training set, but not as many unique examples as the original training set. So that means each tree in the forest is trained with a slightly different set of unique examples. <clears throat> so that makes sure that the trees in the forest are different from each other and they're not all just being trained with the same data because if they're all trained with the same data, they're all gonna be the same and then there's no point of ensembling a whole bunch of trees that are the same. Um, and then for predictor bagging, each branch node is trained with only a random subset of the predictors. So I was telling you earlier that if we have 41 predictor variables at, at each one of these branch nodes, the training algorithm is gonna loop through all 41 predictor variables, and then it's gonna loop through a bunch of thresholds for each predictor variable to determine which combination of predictor variable and threshold is the best. But in random forests, when you do predictor bagging, uh, the default is that you take the square root of the total number of predictors. So if the total number of predictors is 41, the square root is 6.4 something. So you round down to six or round up to seven, it doesn't matter. So instead of looping over all 41 predictors at each branch node, you randomly take six or seven of the predictor variables and only loop over six or seven of the predictor variables at each branch node and you ignore all the rest. So each branch node only has access to a subset of all the predictor variables. So that also ensures that each decision tree ends up being different from the other ones in the forest. So shown below, this is uh, another practical example and uh, you, can, you can find the code for doing all this stuff in the CoLab notebook. So shown here are the results on training data for a random forest with 100 trees that I trained. And again, I don't want you to look at every little aspect of the um, of the evaluation graphics. Just um, the the AUC and then the um, the Briar Skill Score and the Attributes Diagram are the main things I'm focusing on here. So this is for the training data. The AUC is 0 0.917, so it's greater than 0 0.9, which makes this an excellent model. <clears throat> and the reliability curve is pretty close to the one-to-one -one line. There's a little bit of uh, of under prediction here, but it's not terrible. In general, the reliability curve is pretty close to um, to being perfect, and the Briar skill score is 0.335. And now, if we go to the next slide, so we're looking at results on validation data instead of training data, and you can see that they really didn't deteriorate that much. They got a little bit worse, but it's barely even noticeable, and it's probably not even statistically significant. So that means there's <clears throat> not a whole lot of overfitting happening, if any, with the random forest. Uh, so the AUC went down a little bit. It went from 0.917 down to 0.913, and the Briar Skill Score went from 0.335 down to 0.328. Um, but like I said, there's a, there's a good chance that none of that is even significant. <clears throat> so unlike the single decision tree that we were looking at earlier that didn't do a very good job with overfitting, random forests mostly mitigate overfitting. So in this next section, I'm going to talk about gradient-boosted forests. So this is just another way to ensemble decision trees, and then we'll talk about clustering algorithms. So great, uh, in the, the difference between random and gradient boosted forests is that in a random forest, each tree is trained independently of all the others. So you can train all the trees in parallel. <clears throat> so if you have 100 trees in your forest, and let's say you have 100 compute nodes, you can train one decision tree on each compute node 
and they're all independent of each other. So you don't need any communication between the compute nodes. All the trees in the forest are completely different things. The only time they see each other, quote unquote, is when you ensemble them together at the end. Um, whereas in a gradient boosted forest, the first tree in the forest is trained to predict the target variable. So if the target variable is um, hail size in a thunderstorm, for example, the first tree in a gradient boosted forest is trained the same way you would train the first tree in a random forest. It's the same thing. But then after you've trained the first tree in your gradient boosted forest, the next tree is trained to predict the residual. The residual is just the um, the error, uh, sorry, it's the actual value minus the predicted value. So it's um, the, re the residual is minus one times the bias. So the, uh, the second tree is trained to predict predict the residual from the first tree, then the third tree is trained to predict the residual from the first two trees, and the fourth tree is trained to predict the residual from the first three trees, et cetera, et cetera. In general, the kth tree is trained to predict the residual from the, for the first k minus one trees. Um, there's a whole bunch of different boosting algorithms, and I don't intend to get into any of that today. I just want to say that the most popular boosting algorithm is Ada Boost, and you'll probably see that term in the literature if you read uh, any paper that uses gradient boosted for us the um the one the one fancy thing about ada boost is that it weights examples that have worse predictions from the first k uh, decision trees in the forest so for the examples that have really really bad predictions they get a higher weight in the loss function to really force the next tree to do well on the examples that the first trees are doing poorly on and this is just uh, another figure to illustrate the principle of gradient boosted forests. So each, um, w whenever you add a new tree to the forest, it's um, it's just trying to predict what the errors will be from the trees that came before it. Um, so like random forests, gradient boosted forests can use example bagging and they can use predictor bagging. However, the default in most libraries is that there's no example bagging or predictor bagging, but you you can do it if you want. Um, so, so in other words, the, with the default being no example or predictor bagging, that means each tree in the forest is trained with all examples and each branch node is trained with all the predictors. Um, and as I said earlier, in a random forest, you can train all the trees in parallel because they're mutually independent, but in a gradient boosted forest, each tree depends on the ones that came before it. So you can't train them all in parallel. So computationally, it's a little bit more expensive to train a gradient boosted forest than a random forest. Um, the upshot, the or the the advantage rather of gradient boosted forests is they usually make a bit better predictions than random forests. So for example, there's this paper from Amy McGovern back in 2015 discussing a contest that they ran through AMS to predict solar energy with machine learning, and the top three finishers in that contest were all gradient boosted forests. Although I suspect that if they redid that competition today, it would be all deep learning convolutional neural nets and whatnot, but you'll learn about that in a couple weeks. Um, <clears throat> so shown here are the results on training data for a gradient boosted forest with 100 trees. Again, the AUC is well over 0.9, so we have an excellent model according to the rock curve. And in the attributes diagram, the reliability curve really, uh, really closely follows the one-to-one -one line, so we have pretty good, good reliability. The AUC and Briar skill score are a little bit better than the random forest on the training data. And then if we go to the validation data, the results get a little bit worse. So our AUC goes from 0.92 down to 0.912. The Briar skill score decreases by a little bit. If you compare the validation results between the random forest and the gradient boosted forest, in this case, the gradient boosted forest is actually a little bit worse, but in the third decimal place. So again, probably not statistically significant. Um, so I'll hand it over to Ima to start the section on clustering. May we take a break for questions? Are there any questions so far? Because we're really going to switch gears now to something very different. So if you have any questions about decision trees, random forest, and all that, now would be the best time. No questions? Okay. All right. And um, so now we're going to totally switch gears. So, so far you had supervised learning where you know what the output is supposed to be. And now we're gonna move on to unsupervised learning and the most common method there is clustering, which you see, I'm sure lots and lots in papers. And the key motivation to even looking at that is that there's a lot of data without labels, especially in the weather and climate applications. I mean, we have lots of satellite data, but 
but the data isn't always labeled as, oh, this is what's being shown in, in this image. And so getting labels is often a big investment. And so the question is, can we learn anything from unlabeled data? So that's called unsupervised learning methods if you don't have a label. And you, so you basically don't know what the output should be. And this is just learning from unlabeled data. And again, the most common method is clustering. And the basic idea of clustering is if you're given a set of samples, you're trying to break the samples into disjoint groups that are similar in some way. Um, so the criterion for similarity is usually close proximity in space. We're going to talk a little bit, if you have time, about which space. Uh, for now, just look at 2D space and just consider Euclidean distance as a distance. And each group that we're finding, so we're breaking the samples into disjoint groups, and each group that we get at the end is called a cluster. Next slide, please. And this is just a very simple scatter plot. So you're given some samples. Uh, each point is uh, here represents one sample. And we're just going to look at the points in 2D space. And we just start by looking at a scatter plot. And my question to you is, how many clusters do you think are here? And there's more than one proper answer, but there's one common answer. How many clusters do you think are here? You can put it in the chat. You can just call it out. Anyone wants to make a guess? I see something from the chat. I see, I hear seven, six, <laughs> 800, six, six, six. Okay. All right. Lots of people say six. Usually most people say five, but six is also good, right? Because we clearly have one, two, three big things here. And we have this thing. And then it's not clear is this like one cluster? Is this two clusters? And that's one of those things uh, with clustering. It's like, well, how many clusters do you actually want to have? Somebody says not fixed, yeah, because most clustering methods you actually have to decide ahead of time how many clusters do you actually want. Um, but we get to that later. With that, we I turn it back over to Ryan, who will talk to you about k-means clustering, and then I will talk to you about hierarchical clustering and dbSkin. Okay, so uh, k-means clustering and and clustering algorithms in general. Um, which which we haven't gone over yet, but going back to the high level for a couple minutes here. Um, oh no, sorry, Ema did talk about that. I wow, my memory is very short today. Uh, yes, as Ema said, k-means and clustering in general is an example of unsupervised learning. Um, so in unsupervised learning, the the target variable may or may not exist. Um, so you may have no target variable whatsoever. You may just want to do data exploration. So for example, you may have a bunch of radar images of thunderstorms. And you may not even be trying to predict anything. You might just want to do data exploration and see, OK, how many clusters do these radar images naturally fall into? Um, or you may have a target variable. There may be something you want to predict. So you may want to predict the uh, maximum hail size from each storm. But you can do that with unsupervised learning as opposed to supervised learning. Either way, when you're doing unsupervised learning, whether you have a target variable or not, the machine learning model knows only about the predictors. It doesn't see the target variable ever. So it's not trained to make predictions, although you can still use an unsupervised learning model afterwards to make predictions. Basically, the way you do that is you, if you have a new storm, you got the radar image for that new storm, you find the cluster that it belongs to, and then you find all the training examples that also ended up in that cluster, and then you just average the maximum hail size from all those training examples in the cluster, which you'll see. Uh, OK, so the procedure for k-means clustering is that, uh, and I really love this animation here. It's not mine, um, but I, I really like it because it shows you that uh, k-means is an iterative procedure, and at each iteration, you're uh, you're updating the clusters until basically you converge. So until the clusters don't change uh, as you go from one iteration to the next. So in the procedure, the the first step is you have to choose the number of clusters, which is k. That's why we call the algorithm k-means, um, and that. The number of clusters is a hyperparameter, so that's something the user has to decide a priori. And again, you can do hyperparameter tuning, so you can experiment with a bunch of different k values and figure out which is the best, however you define best. Um, the second thing you have to do is choose the initial seeds or the initial cluster centroids. So you'll notice that at iteration one in this animation, there's already cluster centroids, which are these, um, the big red plus sign and the big yellow x and then the big blue circle, the the bold symbols, the, the big bold ones here. Um, so the way the initial seeds are chosen is um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it, and I'm really not going to get into it. But that uh, 
the, the method for choosing the initial seeds is also a hyperparameter. That's all I'll say about that. Um, there's random initial, initialization, but then there's also smart initialization tactics. Um, and then for each example in the training set, so if you call the training set, um, you just, just represent it as a, as a matrix X where each row of the matrix corresponds to one data point and each column corresponds to one predictor variable. So as uh, the same notation that I used in lecture two. Um, so in step three, for each example in the training set X, you find the cluster whose centroid is closest to, uh, to X sub I, and then you assign the ith example to that cluster, to the nearest cluster. Um, and like Ema said, the nearest cluster, the, the way you compute distances is uh, usually Euclidean. And in the Colab notebook, for example, there's 41 predictors. So Euclidean distance is in 41 dimensional space, as opposed to the two dimensional space you're seeing in this animation. Um, and then based on the new cluster assignment from step three, you have to recompute the, the centroids. So that's step four of the algorithm. And the centroid of each cluster is just the element-wise average of the predictor vectors of the examples assigned to it. So for example, if you have, um, if cluster one has 100 different examples assigned to it and you've got 41 different predictor variables, you just go through each predictor variable and take the average over the 100 examples in that cluster and that um, those 41 average values end up becoming the, the centroid of the cluster. So it's just um, you average each of the predictor variables independently. And then step five of this algorithm is you repeat steps three and four until you converge. And convergence means the cluster assignment hasn't changed between successive iterations. Um, so we're going to do a live example here just to, uh, to get everyone engaged and hopefully make everyone understand this algorithm. So I'm just going to get volunteers to enter their information in the chat window, and then I'm going to compute things on the fly. So the predictor variable in this case is going to be when you woke up today. Um, please put that in mountain daylight time if you can, <laughs> so we don't have to deal with time zone issues. Um, so the predictor variable will, will be when you woke up today in mountain daylight time, and the target variable will be the current charge on your phone battery in percentage. And we're going to go with three clusters. So I've chosen the initial seeds or the cluster centroids, which are 0600, 0800, and 1000 mountain daylight time. Um, so when you enter your information in the chat, please tell me your predictor variable and also your target variable. So when you woke up today and the current charge on your phone. And if you can, please give me that in the, um, in the same message. If you've already sent a message with only the time you woke up, uh, feel free to send another message with both pieces of information because that'll just make this easier. Um, and I think, since I'm in PowerPoint here, I can edit this stuff on the fly. Okay, so I'm getting a whole bunch of replies. Um, I'm going to go back. Okay, so we have 0700. I'm going to have to create a worksheet here, I think. <laughs> All right. Uh, 0700 and 92%. We've got 0715 and 46%. Someone's still got 100% on their phone. Oh, 0,668%. I'm probably only going to take uh, 15 of these data points just so I'm not sitting around here calculating things for too long. We've got 0,585%. We've got 0,730, 93%. We've got 0,604%. Charge your phone. My goodness. Um, we have... 0860 percent we've got 0730 44 percent we've got 0655 percent 0715 95 percent how many data points is that so far that's 11 i'll take four more data points so we can get an even 15. um we've got 0715 53 percent we've got 0587 percent um, we've got 12.30, nice, respect. Um, and then we've got 0,625%. Okay, so our initial cluster centroids are 0,600, 0,800, and 1,000. Um, 1,000, that feels weird to say. Mountain daylight time. So first of all, we're going to find all the examples that are closest to the 0,600 cluster. That's, um, whoops, oh, what did I do? Uh, okay. And we're going to put all the examples closest to the 0600 cluster in red. And keep in mind, this assignment to the, the 0600 cluster is only based on the predictor variable, which is when you woke up. 
So I'm looking for the times that are closer to 0600 than um, 0800 or 1000. Okay. And then the next cluster, um, we're going to round 0700 up to 0800. So that's going to be in the second cluster. Um, so the people in the second cluster are going to be in blue. You're in blue. And you're in blue. And then we have one singleton cluster that I'll just keep in black here. So the person who woke up at 1230, again, mad respect, um, you were in a cluster all on your own. So now if we compute the cluster centroids, um, so for the red cluster, uh, oh, how am I going to do this? OK, I'll just add, uh, add up all the times in my head. So 28, 34. 3945 divided by seven members in that cluster. Okay, so the average wake up time, uh, what? Okay. 945 divided by seven members in that cluster. Okay. <clears throat> For some reason, my, my brain is blanking right now on, um, on averaging times. Oh, of course. Right, right, right. time okay so for the people in the first cluster your average wake up time is about 0541 and then the average charge on your phone batteries is we have 100 plus 68 plus 85 plus 4 plus 55 plus 87 plus 25 divided by seven. So the average charge on your phone batteries is 61%. And for the people in the second cluster, your average wake up time is 777777. So it's 42, 50, 51. Okay. People in the second cluster, your average wake up time is 0724. And then the average charge on your phone batteries is 22 plus 46 plus 93 plus 60 plus 44. Okay, 69%. And then for the single person in the third cluster, I don't have to do any math for you, which is great. It makes my life much easier. Okay. So Everything I've just done here is one iteration of k-means clustering. So I've, if we go back to the algorithm here, I've chosen the number of clusters, which is three. I've chosen the initial seeds, which were 0600, 0800, and 1000 mountain time. And then for each example in the training set, which was the 15 people who gave me their information, I found the nearest centroid. And then I went to step four and I recomputed the centroids. In this case, there's only one predictor variable, so it's not super exciting. But if we had two predictor variables, um, if it were the time you woke up and, um, oh, I don't know, the um, say the the model of your the model of your phone or something like that, that would be the second predictor variable, and then I would find the average value of that predictor variable for each cluster as well. But in this case, there's only one predictor variable. So I've done steps three and four, but I've only done them once. I haven't repeated steps three and four until convergence. Um, and I probably don't have time to to do a second iteration here. So what I was planning to do is compute the cluster centroids once and then um, and then do it again, but that's okay. So now I'm gonna take the guinea pig. So we have uh, the, the 15 people who originally volunteered. I've taken the data from them. And now I'm just gonna take a random person in the chat um okay so to keep it anonymous um sierra csu we don't know who that person is um so sierra csu replied and they said that they woke up at 0730 and the current charge on their phone battery is 69 percent so they're the um they're the guinea pig now so we're gonna um we're gonna use this clustering that we've done to predict the current charge on the phone battery of whoever's running the sierra csu account so they woke up at 0730, and if we look at the cluster centroids here, the, the nearest cluster to 0730 is clearly 0724, only six minutes away. 
And the predicted value for people in that second cluster based on the seven training members who ended up in that cluster is that their phone battery has a charge of 69%. So in this case, we have a perfect prediction. We've perfectly predicted the uh, charge on the phone battery for CIRA CSU. Um, if we look at the last person who volunteered, they say they woke up at 0610 and the current charge on their phone battery is 100%. So the closest cluster to 0610 is the people who woke up at 0541 on average. And the predicted um, battery charge would be 61%. So in that case, we'd have uh, a prediction that's much further off because this person actually has a, a battery charge of 100%. So that's an example of how you use k-means clustering to make predictions. And then this is uh, this numbered algorithm here is just um, a formalization of all the stuff that I just did. So I'll turn it back over to Ema, although I don't think we have time for agglomerative clustering, but in case you want to say anything, I'll turn it back over to you for a minute. No, nothing to say. Just uh, we're going to cut the remaining material for today and go straight to the CoLab notebook, as we promised, because we want to make sure we have enough time for CoLab. And we can discuss later whether we should cover the remaining material next time. I think it might be better to just move next time clearly into neural networks and maybe do clustering in session six. But if you have some feedback on that, feel free to let us know in the chat room. Um, but otherwise, let's move on to the CoLab notebook. And I put the CoLab notebook link in the chat. And I can put it there again if you have to scroll up too much. Yeah, if anyone can't get onto the CoLab notebook, uh, please let us know in the chat or feel free to speak up. And we'll make sure you um, we'll make sure that everyone's on. So again, once you've connected to the CoLab notebook, uh, the first thing you have to do is connect to the virtual runtime. So you just have to click on the connect button up here. It should take all of five, ten seconds to connect you to a virtual machine. And then once you're in the CoLab notebook, uh, you'll notice. I think we went over this um, in earlier lectures, but I'll just uh, I'll say it again. Some of these boxes only have text in them, so there's no code that's actually runnable. So like this first cell is only text. You can't run it. Um, there would be no point in running it because it wouldn't do anything. Um, but anything that uh, anything that's in this monospace font has code in it. And uh, some of these code cells are marked required. So you can see in the table of contents on the left, Anything March required, it means you have to run that code cell before you run code cells that come after it in the notebook. So if you miss one of these code cells marked required and then try to run something later, there's a good chance it'll crash because there's just um, there's variables and data that are created by the code that comes earlier in the notebook that just aren't there yet. Um, so I'm going to get everyone to just run the required cells in the notebook before doing anything else, and that's just these seven here. And again, the way you run a cell is by clicking on the play button. I'm going to try to click on the play button and not use keyboard combinations, because obviously you can't see my fingers on the keyboard. Um, but you can click shift enter if you want as well. And you can also click these play buttons um, before the previous cells are done running. It'll just create a queue. So you can just keep scrolling down. And um, anything that's marked required, just click the play button next to that code cell. And this uh, this stuff that you're clicking on is um, it's mostly just doing housekeeping. So we're downloading the GitHub repository for the course, which contains all the code I've written to run these notebooks. We're importing packages. We're downloading the input data. We're reading the input data, normalizing the input data, and then binarization means turning the target variable from a real value into a uh, into a category so that we can do binary classification because this notebook is going to focus on only on binary classification. <clears throat> um, and I, I suppose it's it's worth talking about binarization for a minute before I go on to everything else. So I've taken the um, if if we were doing regression or prediction of a real value, we would be predicting the maximum future vorticity for each storm. Um, which is clearly a continuous value. It can it can take on an infinite number of uh, of values, um, but in this case, uh, binarization means that we're we're turning that variable into a yes or no thing. And the threshold I've picked for binarization is 3.85 times 10 to the minus three inverse seconds. 
So if you're um, if you're familiar with thunderstorm scale rotation, uh, usually 0 0.001 inverse seconds is uh, a high value for vorticity. And in this case, the the threshold is 0 0.00385 or approximately 0 0.004 inverse seconds. So any value greater than that, we're calling strong rotation. Any value not greater than that, we're calling weak rotation. And that's how we turn this from a regression problem into a classification problem. Hey, Ryan. Yes. So the list of binarized target values for the first training example, I'm a little confused. Why are they the same as the real number? Should that be a set of zeros and ones? Uh, yeah, you're right. It totally should be. Um, yes, I, what did I do? Yeah, I see what I did. I, <clears throat> if, if you reload, there you go. <laughs> If you reload the notebook, um, it'll probably incorporate my the edit that I just made to um, to unscrew up that printout. But yeah, good catch. Um, so the binarized target values should all be zeros and ones. They shouldn't um, they shouldn't have decimals in them. So thank you for that. So if you reload, really you have to. Down. Just wanted to say, if you reload, you have to rewind all the required sessions. That's today. right. Yeah. But that's okay. I was going to say at the end of the, the last collab, the same thing was occurring with the binarization. So they probably got to fix it okay. in the previous collab. Okay. Heads up. So. Thank you. Yeah. I'll make a note to myself to do that. So I'm going to go to single decision trees and just walk you through the procedure for uh, for training a decision tree and evaluating a decision tree and then there's some code in here that will plot a decision tree so there's that um that plot i showed you throughout the lecture today that um it was just a dummy example that i made up in my head with cape and, and downdraft cape but in this case you'll um you'll train a real decision tree and then visualize the real decision tree uh, so if you scroll through the section on decision trees i put the theory in here as well so you can uh, you can read basically the same stuff in the slides, although the stuff I've put in the collab notebook is worded a little bit differently. And again, if you're the kind of person who learns by seeing things worded a slightly different way, um, you may want to go over that. Otherwise, feel free not to go over it. So this code cell down here, mark training and evaluation, um, what well, does what it advertises, it does training and evaluation. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through the the code statements in this cell. And uh, the point of this uh, of this course isn't to uh, to get into nitty gritty Python. So we're not trying to teach people how to do um, how to do every little aspect of the programming. But um, one thing that I will note is you'll see a whole bunch of method calls in here that are utils dot something. So utils dot setup classification tree, utils dot train classification tree, etc. There is a utils dot pi that's inside that GitHub repository, and all these methods. If you want to see the lower level code, they're inside the utils.py. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that you could um, that you could take and likely adapt to your own machine learning problems if you'd like. And I'll go, uh, for the most part, I'm going to stay out of utils.py and I'm going to stay inside the Jupyter Notebook. So we're going to stay, um, we're going to focus on higher level code. But um, for a few minutes today, I will go inside utils.py and show you what's under the hood of some of these methods just to get you a feel for it. Um, so this is for the default decision tree that I showed during the slides. And this uh, this first statement here, set up classification tree, um, I mean, it does as advertised. And the two hyperparameters I'm choosing here are the, the minimum sample size at a branch node or split node is 30, and the minimum sample size at a leaf node is 30. So once um, once we can no longer create branch nodes or leaf nodes with at least 30 examples in them, we stop training. So that's the stopping criterion for this decision tree to prevent it from just getting deeper and deeper until it overfits terribly. Um, and then this next command here is utils.train classification tree. So again, it does as advertised. So it takes in three input arguments. One is the model object, which we just created here with setup classification tree. It's called default tree model object. So that's the um, the first input to this method. The second input is the um, the training predictor table. So that's uh, and if you hover over that, you actually get um, you get this really nice pop up message telling you that it's a pandas data frame, and it has shape seventy six thousand three hundred seventy seven by forty one. 
so that's the um, that's the matrix thing that uh, that I showed in the lecture last week. So each row of that matrix is one example, and then each column is one predictor variable. So in this case, uh, like I said earlier, we have 41 predictor variables, and we have 76,000 some odd training examples. And then this third input argument to train classification tree is the training target table. It's a data frame with, again, 76,000 some odd examples. And there's two variables in here. One is the target variable for regression, which will be ignored because we're doing classification here. And then the second is just that binarized zero or one thing for a classification. So it's a zero if the storm uh, doesn't achieve strong rotation in the future. And it's a one if the, if the storm achieves strong rotation in the future. So this method call trains the classification tree. It runs that training algorithm to determine the best question to ask at each branch node. And then the um, this statement here, it takes the uh, the default tree model object. So that's the decision tree we just trained. And it calls predict underscore prob A. Um, so that, that method is, um, that's part of the scikit-learn library. So that's not something that I wrote. Um, predict underscore prob A for any scikit-learn model will give you uh, predicted event probabilities. So in this case, I'm creating a um, I'm creating a NumPy array called training probabilities, and training probabilities is um, it's got one uh, it's got a forecast probability of strong rotation for every single training example. So all 76,000 of them, <clears throat> and then uh, training event frequency is the, um, that's the event frequency and the training data or the climatology. So it's just the, uh, the percentage of training examples that achieve strong rotation in the future. We need this event frequency or this climatology to create the attributes diagram, to plot the reference lines in the background of the attributes diagram. I see a question in the chat and I'll, I'll get to that in, um, yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so once we've created this uh, this array of training probabilities, we figured out what the training event frequency or the climatology is, so we can make an attributes diagram. This next method call is eval binary classification. Um, so I did shorten things a little bit here. <clears throat> and this, um, this method just evaluates a binary classification model. So it creates the rock curve, it creates the performance diagram, and it creates the attributes diagram. The input arguments are uh, an array of observed labels an array of forecast probabilities and then the event frequency to um, to plot in the attributes diagram and then the name of the data set which you can make whatever you want and that'll appear in the title of all the figures here and then these next two commands are doing the exact same thing as above except for the validation set instead of the training set so here i'm creating the forecast probability for each validation example of which there's a, there's a little over 25,000 validation examples, and they come from a different year than the training examples, so they're fully independent storms. And then I evaluate the uh, decision tree on the validation data set. So if you click play on this cell, it should run everything and show you those figures that I was just showing you a few seconds ago. There we go. And these, uh, these are the figures that I showed you in the slides as well. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going over them. Um, but here at the top, you get the rock curve on the training data. You get the performance diagram on the training data. You get the attributes diagram on the training data. Um, and if you scroll down to this text output, you get a few more numbers that are, um, they're mostly reported in the figures as well. But if you um, if you're the kind of person who likes to see text output and not just figures, there's that stuff for you as well. And then if you keep scrolling through the output of this cell, you'll get the rock curve performance diagram and attributes diagram. But now for the validation data instead of the training data. Um, and I'll look at that question in the chat now. Okay. Don't know. If... Okay. So it looks like there's still an issue with the binarization code. Uh, thanks, Tanya. I'll look at that after the um, after our session today and make sure that I get that fixed. I apologize for my bug. Um, and the uh, the next code cell that I'll take you through is plotting the tree. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the uh, of the plots that uh, that this is the the scikit-learn library that's creating this plot. I'm not a huge fan of these plots, but they do um, they give you some idea of what's going on in your decision tree. They're not the most aesthetically pleasing things, but 
it's it's kind of hard to write a library that can plot any decision tree with any arbitrary number of uh, of nodes in it. So I'll get you to uh, to click play on this code cell. So this uh, this method utils dot plot decision tree. It takes again a few input input arguments. So one is the the model object, which should be um, it should be a trained decision tree, uh, obviously. So this is the default tree model object, the one that we just trained. The uh, second thing is the names of the predictor variables, so that uh, if you don't give it this array and you don't tell it the names of the predictor variables, it'll create its own names, and they're just like variable one, variable two, variable three. Um, so your decision tree plot isn't going to be super meaningful. Um, and then the other input arguments are the number of levels to show. So how um, this decision tree, I think, is quite deep. I think it has 15 or 20 levels. But if we plot 15 or 20 levels, we're just going to have uh, spaghetti on this page. And you're not going to be able to read any of the fonts or anything. Um, so I limited this at depth three. And then uh, you also want to choose a font size that will um, that'll make the labels fit inside the nodes. So if we look at this decision tree we just trained, I should note that all the predictor variables here have been normalized to z-scores, so positive values, it's it's just the number of standard deviations away from the mean. Um, so don't expect to see physical values here with the predictor variables. So the first question we're seeing here is um, this, this is the root node at the very top, and the predictor variable is the maximum composite reflectivity inside the storm. And we're asking, is it uh, is it greater than or less than 0.8? So in this case, that means 0.8 standard deviations above the mean. And then these numbers here, uh, this number at the top shows you the total number of uh, of training examples that reach this node. And it's all the training examples because this is the root node. So we have 76,000 some odd training examples and 76,000 some odd examples go to this node. And then these two numbers here in the brackets tell you the number of positive cases and the number of negative cases. So there's 68,000 some odd storms that don't have strong future rotation and 7,600 some odd storms that do have strong future rotation. The, these numbers have the same meanings in, uh, in every single one of these cells. So the first question is based on composite reflectivity. And uh, in these plots, I actually can't remember which arrow corresponds to, uh, to values greater than 0.8 and which one corresponds to values less than 0.8. Um, but uh, I, I don't think it really matters much. Um, so once you get down to the, uh, the, the two child nodes, um, both child nodes end up asking a question about the area of the storm, which is in square kilometers. But again, we've gone to non-physical units because I've normalized everything. So uh, this is an example going back to, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the person who asked me, but someone asked a question earlier about um, how, how you would deal with uh, it, it, how you how you would deal with relationships for a predictor variable that involve various thresholds, and the way you do that is uh, the the predictor variable just ends up being involved in a bunch of different branch nodes with a different threshold at each branch node. So you can totally see that in this decision tree, because uh, for example, maximum composite reflectivity shows up twice up here and down here, and the area of the storm shows up three times. So it's here, here, and down here as well. Um, so this, uh, this, this node is asking, uh, if the area of the storm is greater than or less than, uh, 0.16 standard deviations below the mean. And this node here is asking, is the area of the storm greater than or less than 0.47 standard deviations above the mean, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you keep splitting these storms until eventually you, uh, you get to the leaf nodes and then each leaf node will give you a predicted probability of strong rotation based on um, based on just the training examples that reach that leaf node. So if you have 100 training examples reach that leaf node and 40 of them have strong rotation in the future, the forecast probability at that leaf node will be 40%. Um, so I, I hope these few code cells have shown you some of the mechanics of training a decision tree. The, uh, the mechanics for training random forests and gradient boosted forests and really any other type of model in scikit-learn are very, very similar. Um, so I'm not going to walk you through every line of those code cells. Um, what I would like to show here is an example of a hyperparameter experiment. So I'm going to go ahead to this next section called Tuning Decision Tree Hyperparameters, but also I'll stop to see if there's any questions first. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. It sounds like no questions are imminent, um, but if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to speak up or put it in the chat, and I'll make sure to reply. Um, so this is the uh, the one section of the slides that I skipped over and told you you would see in the CoLab notebook, so fulfilling that promise. Um, this is showing you how to properly conduct a hyperparameter experiment, and this is something I really stress throughout these CoLab notebooks because I see a lot of um, a lot of bad practices when it comes to doing hyperparameter experiments. So, as I said earlier, there's two hyperparameters among others that control the depth of a decision tree and how much it can overfit, and those are the minimum sample size per branch node, which I'm calling NB min, and then the minimum sample size per leaf node, which I'm calling NL min. Um, so if you set both of these values to one, that means the decision tree will keep often, will keep growing and growing and growing and growing until you've got a whole bunch, thousands and thousands of leaf nodes um, where each leaf node only has one or a few examples in it. Um, so that means that each prediction you make with this decision tree in the future will only be based on the one or few examples that reach this leaf node and uh, making predictions based on a small sample size is bad and generally leads to overfitting. So you wanna prevent that from happening. Um, conversely, if you set these these values, NB min and NL min to be too high, for example, if the, the size of the training set is 76,000 examples, if you set both these ex both these values to be 76,000, you're gonna end up with a decision stump where you've only got one question at the root node and then you've got two leaf nodes that come directly off it. So your whole decision tree is based on one predictor variable and one question. And that's usually gonna be bad unless you have a really ridiculously simple problem um, that's gonna cause underfitting rather than overfitting. And again, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, so you wanna find a balance. You you want to find values for these hyperparameters that are a happy medium, so not too small and not too big. So there's four steps for any hyperparameter experiment. The uh, the first step is you need to choose the values you're going to attempt, and often this is um, this is something that depends a lot on your intuition. So if you've if you've been doing machine learning for a while and you've done similar problems in the past and you kind of have an idea of which values work, um, those those are generally the values that you're going to attempt. So for example, if uh, if I've done work with decision trees in the past, and, and I've had the most success setting both of these values to 100, and now I have this new problem where I don't know what the best values of these hyperparameters are, I'm going to try tweaking the values around 100. So 100 is going to be my central point, and maybe I'll try going all the way down to 25, and maybe I'll try going all the way up to 1,000. But I'm going to I'm going to tweak these hyperparameters around 100 because I know 100 has worked well in the past. Whereas if I have previous experience telling me that any values less than 1,000 lead to an absolute garbage decision tree, then chances are I'm not going to try values less than 1,000. Um, so that's the the first step of the hyperparameter experiment is you need to choose the values you you need to choose the hyperparameters you're going to play with first and then you need to choose the possible values for each hyperparameter. So that's what I've done here. I'm taking the minimum sample size per branch node, varying that from 2 to 500, and the minimum sample size per leaf node I'm varying from 1 to 500. The second thing you have to do is train a model with each combination. So this is what I call grid search where I have a uh, Oh, what is this, 10, 10 possible values for NB min and 10 possible values for NL min. So, so I create a 10 by 10 grid of my hyperparameters. That means there's 100 possible combinations, and I'm going to train a decision tree with each one of those 100 possible combinations. <clears throat> um, so that's called a grid search. Often, um, grid search has a problem called combinatorial explosion, where let's say you have eight hyperparameters you're playing with and you have 10 possible values for each hyperparameter, if you just create a grid and try every possible combination, there's going to be 10 to the 8 combinations, which is 100 million? Yeah. Um, and chances are you're not going to have the time or the, uh, or the computing nodes to train 100 million different models. So in that case, if you have a huge number of hyperparameters, instead of doing a grid search, you often want to do a random search and just randomly sample 10,000 points in that hyperparameter space instead of doing all 100 million. Um, but in all the examples I show in these notebooks, I'm doing grid search. And then the third step of the hyperparameter experiment is you take 
uh, you, you've trained each model on the training data. Now you want to evaluate each model on the validation data. So this tells you how good each model is on an independent set of data that you haven't trained it with. And then finally, step four is you select the model that performs best on the validation data. The way you define that is really up to you. It depends on the nature of the problem. So the best model could be the one that gives you the highest area under the rock curve. It could be the one that gives you the highest CSI, the highest prior skill score, uh, what, whatever you care about for your particular problem. There's no, um, there's no general rule about what evaluation score you should use to define what the best model is. So you really just, um, you need to know your problem and you need to know what you want. And in this case, I'm defining the best model as the one that has the, the highest Breyer skill score. So the best Breyer score compared to climatology. So this next code cell is labeled training and I'll get everyone to run it. it uh, it'll probably take a couple minutes, which will, um, and we have six minutes left. So that'll give me some time to go through this code cell. Oh, I have a question. Yes, um, it it occurred to me earlier today. I th I think I sent out a link to the um, to the actual Python code in the GitHub repository, but I did that a while ago. So I'll send an email as soon as this session is done with a link to that GitHub code so that you can go into utils.py and you can see all these methods that I'm calling because I don't want this to be a, a secret or anything. This is this is all supposed to be open source. Um, so I'll share the actual Python code with you so that you can drill into the, to the lower level stuff if you want. Um, so in this code cell here, I'm defining two arrays. These are just the arrays of hyperparameter values that I want to try. So the minimum sample size per branch node, the minimum sample size per leaf node, I'm just creating these arrays. <clears throat> and then I'm initializing matrices. These are just two-dimensional NumPy arrays that are going to hold the results on the validation data. So there's four different scores that I'm computing on the validation data for each model. So there's AUC, which is area under the rock curve. There's the maximum CSI, the Breyer score, and then the Breyer skill score. And I also need to compute this training event frequency or climatology because that goes into computing the Breyer skill score because the Breyer skill score is comparing the actual Breyer score to the one you get from climatology. And uh, you'll notice I have this if statement here. So if the minimum sample size per leaf node is greater than the minimum sample size per branch node, I don't bother training that model because it's uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. So if the minimum sample size per leaf node is 100, but the minimum sample size per branch node is 1, you're never going to end up with a case where you have one example in the branch node, but then end up with 100 and a leaf node below it. So I just don't bother with these impossible combinations. <clears throat> um, and again, you're... You're going to see similar methods here to the ones you saw earlier for training the default decision tree. So this is um, for each, I have this double for loop here going over each possible combination of hyperparameter values. So for each possible combination of that NB min and NL min, I call utils.setup classification tree. So this just sets up the, um, the architecture of the tree without actually training it. So I've created my model object and then I call utils.train classification tree. And I train, uh, I train on the training data. That should be obvious, but I'm not touching the validation data here. I'm not touching the testing data here. Only training data are being used in this part of the procedure. And then I take that model I just trained, and I create forecast probabilities for the validation data. So for each validation example, I'm getting the forecast probability of strong rotation from that model I just trained. I call utils.eval binary classification. So now I'm evaluating the model I just trained and evaluating it only on the validation data. So you'll notice I have um, validation target table here and validation predictions here. So only the validation data are being used to evaluate this model I just trained. And then I just assign values into my NumPy arrays. So I find area under the rock curve, the maximum CSI, the Breyer score, the Breyer skill score, and I put those in my NumPy arrays. Um, and this code cell is still running. But thankfully, I, I did run everything earlier, so I can show you the output of it. Um, so now we're at step three of the hyperparameter experiment, where we um, <clears throat> we have all, all the models trained. So for each combination of hyperparameters, we've trained the models. And now I want to um, I want to just visualize the scores on the validation data. And if you have a two-dimensional space, like in this case, I only have two hyperparameters, 
I find the easiest way to visualize stuff like like this is to um, plot two-dimensional color maps, but your mileage may vary, um, especially for people who um, who are colorblind. Although I think I used a colorblind-friendly scheme here, but there are people who just um, who like visualizing data in different ways. So this isn't a hard and fast rule that you have to create a plot like this. Um, so in this case, what I'm showing on the x-axis is the minimum sample size per leaf node. Y-axis is minimum sample size per branch node. And in this first plot, I'm showing you the area under the rock curve on validation data only, and that's in the color scheme. So higher values of AUC are better, and the higher values here are in yellow. So you'll notice that as you go towards the top right of the plot, the, uh, the values get better and better. So as you increase the minimum sample size per leaf node and the minimum sample size per branch node, you get a higher AUC, and you're going to see basically the same pattern in all the plots. So in this next plot, we're looking at maximum CSI. This is CSI maximized over all probability thresholds. And again, as you go towards the top right, CSI values get better. This next plot is showing Breyer score. Um, so remember, Breyer score is it's like the mean squared error, but for classification and not regression. And it's a negatively oriented thing. So lower Breyer score is better. So you want to see purple values. And as you go to the top right, the values get more and more purple-ish. Um, so again, for, for all four of the scores that I've plotted here, the values improve as you increase the minimum sample size per leaf node and per branch node. Um, so we've only got a minute left here. So I'll just jump ahead quickly to the next code cell. This does step four of the hyperparameter experiment, which is just selecting the model that performs best on the validation data. So these, um, these five commands up here that all start with best underscore something are just finding the model that achieves the best Breyer skill score on the validation data. So I'm finding the model with the highest validation Breyer skill score, or BSS, as I've abbreviated it. And then um, you you don't actually uh, you don't actually have to do this part, but in this case I'm uh, I'm I'm training a new model with those same hyperparameters. So I'm finding the hyperparameters which were um, minimum sample size per branch node of 500 and minimum sample size per leaf node of 200. Those are the hyperparameters that gave me the best model, and then I'm training a new model with those hyperparameters. But again, only training that new model on the training data, and this is this is the only point where I look at results on testing data. Um, so this is really the last point that I want to hammer home before I let everyone go. Um, I will also stay for questions at the end if if anyone wants to hang back and discuss things. Um, but the one point I just want to hammer home before uh, concluding all this is that this this is the only time you should be looking at results on your testing data. It's at the very end of all your hyperparameter experiments. Um, because the whole purpose of looking at testing data is uh, you, you have the training data set, which you've used to directly train your model, and then you have the validation data set, which you've used to choose the best hyperparameters. So your model has already been tweaked using the training set and using the validation set. So the testing set is the one data set you have left that you haven't used to make any decisions yet. Um, so when you're evaluating how good your model truly is and how good your how good you think your model will be in the wild if you ever put it into operations, for example, in a forecast office, that's the only time you look at the testing data. And the testing data should never be used to um, to make any decisions. It's something you just keep until the end to look at the performance of your model on one last independent data set. Um, so in this case, for the um, for the best model with a minimum sample size of 500 per branch node and 200 per leaf node, when we look at the testing data, we get an AUC of 0 0.9, which is the, the threshold for an excellent quote-unquote model. If we look at the performance diagram, we have a maximum CSI of greater than 0 0.4. And if we look at the attributes diagram, um, this reliability curve, uh, it doesn't exactly follow the one-to-one -one line, but it's pretty close to the one-to-one -one line. There's um, there's there's a little bit of jaggy stuff happening here, but for the most part, this model is pretty well calibrated or reliable, as they say. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude. And uh, if anyone has questions, yeah, I'll stick around for a while. All right, thank you, Ryan. Um, so with that, we'll wrap it up. Um, there's okay. So overall, I just asked in the chat whether people are okay with next time us going straight into neural networks. And so far, the feedback has all been 
uh, positive in that direction. So let's just decide to do that next time and start clear and fresh with neural networks next time. And we can still do the clustering in uh, lecture number six, and we can also individually talk about it. So with that, I will wrap it up. I will stop the recording. If anybody has questions, we'll still be around. So let me just stop the recording now.